Hey you guys, John Brett here. I'm gonna do a video for you on properties of clay. So what is gonna happen here, what has been happening is I have this free online glaze course and this is probably number 27. I think 26 was types of clay. So I talked about like fire clay, stonework clay, like that, properties of that. And then prior to that, I talked about a little bit about geology and how those clays may be formed. So today we're gonna to go into a little bit of properties of clay. And what that leads to then is how to construct your own clay body, which I'll do a little bit here, but I'm gonna do in the next video. And then I'll talk uh, in the video following that will be like, uh, what to do if you get wild clay and how to how to deal with that but this is all setting that up for you okay so today I am going to uh, show you some books as always uh, and another thing you should do this is a you know just a free simple class for beginners and stuff and um, what you probably want to do is like when I'm telling you this stuff, you probably want, like if I said clay particle is a stack, hexagonal plates, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're going to Google that and do electron microscope and up will come a bunch of pictures and then you can fill in sort of the things I leave out or I can't do because I'm like OG here on the, uh, this is a Dr. Bruner uh, soap uh, style of uh, <laughs> classes. You may have to look that up if you're young. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you the books. I'll show you some ways uh, that I've gotten recipes for clay bodies and uh, places to look for that. And then I'll just go through each of these uh, properties, talk a little bit about it, and then we'll go on from there. All right, so we're going to start now with there's about seven properties I have listed. As I was doing this, I realized kind of absorption and uh, vitreous are sort of together. So basically you, you're you gonna have uh, plasticity, you'll have shrinkage of clay, you'll have absorption and whether or not it's vitreous or not. You'll have clay hardness, color and texture. And so, you want to know a little bit about all that stuff so when you're constructing a clay body or just looking at your clay body, then you're going to have a better idea of, you know, when somebody says clay is short, you'll have an idea what that means and why that is. Okay, so also this relates to glazes too because there's clay in glazes. So this is the most important material that we're dealing with. We use it in everything. So you should know stuff about the clay particle, maybe the chemical uh, or the molecular or the molecule. That's how it's represented. Um, all right, so plasticity is the first thing. So the plasticity means the ability to be deformed and retain that shape when under pressure and that pressure is removed without cracking. So, uh, if you if you take roll out a snake of clay and then you um, bend it into it, like I try to tie a knot with it, it'll crack. That means it's short. If it's real smooth and it can do that, it's super plastic. Okay, and we like that in throwing and hand building and stuff, so that when we form something, it doesn't crack on us. Uh, okay, so short means that it can't withstand that deformation. All right, so every every there uh, many things are plastic. Like steel is plastic at high pressure, uh, and glass is plastic at high temperature. And, but clay, the beauty of it is it's plastic at room temperature. So um, all right, so that's that. Now there are agents that account for plasticity, and there's I don't know how many two four seven of them. Uh, so it would be the shape of the particle, the size of the particle, the electrical attraction, bacteria that's present, carbonaceous matter, water, and then aging. And so we'll go through each of these real quick. So the shape of the clay particle is thin hexagonal plates that are stacked like books of cards. So you, you'll, you can Google that and you'll see it. Uh, and so that gives it, it's a high surface area. 
And what happens is the water gets in between these plates and um, uh, I mean, I could probably draw them. So, so what happens is like the water, so here's these hexagonal plates, thin. Now water gets in between there. That's what creates plasticity because the, the plates slide across on this water. And that's also what causes shrinkage because as that water leaves, uh, it's going to, uh, the particles will then uh, come back, come back down. Okay. So now say, so if you want to know something about the, the particle, it's very small. It's two grams of clay spread end to end. Uh, one particle thick would make 6,000 square feet. So that is a very small particle. Two grams. Think of that. A 50 pound bag of bentonite is a, that's a type of clay can cover 2,400 acres. So that's half of a football field. Uh, and so bentonite is a very highly uh, plastic material. It's uh, five to ten times uh, the, the absorption absorbs that much water. Uh, and, it, and it can swell 15 to 18 times its volume. So one good way to do that is to go get some bentonite, put it in a cup, add some water and come back the next day and then see what that looks like. You'll, you'll be amazed at how much water bentonite absorbs. That's one of our most plastic materials. All right, so the next agent that accounts for plasticity is gonna be size of the particle. It's very small, it's one micron. So that's one one thousandth of a centimeter. And so, the high percentage of particles in clay, there's a very high percentage that are less than one micron. And so for instance, like, so kaolin is not as plastic as ball clay. And so you can kind of see that by the particle size. So 60% of particles are less than one micron in kaolin and 80% are um, less than one micron in uh, ball clay. So that shows that that would be more plastic. All right, so also clay particles are 10 to 1 long versus thick. So 10, 10 to 1, uh, and that gives them a large surface area. All right, uh, okay, now another thing that accounts for uh, plasticity in clay is electrical attraction. So you can have a positive or negative charge of these particles. Uh, so let's see, Pro a property that allows you to, okay, so you can control the charge of this particle, and we call that flocculation and deflocculation. If the particles are attracted, they, they will be flocked together, and they hold tight like that. If they're repelling one another, sort of like a magnet, they can stay in suspension, but over time they'll settle. So that's deflocculation. So flocculation forms groups uh, to suspend, uh, like flocks of sheep, puffy clouds that hold things up. Uh, you can also Google this. I have a couple of videos on uh, flocculation and deflocculation of glazes and slips. I, in this course, I have a whole thing on slip. So if you didn't see that, you might go check that out. All right, another agent of, that counts for plasticity is bacteria in clay. So bacteria is basically colloidal gels that are less than one micron and they don't settle. Uh, so that's fats and proteins. And then um, uh, this bacteria also excretes an acid. So that's basically how it flocculates the clay. That's why having clay uh, bacteria in clay and aging it makes it better um, to throw with and more plastic, Yeah, let's say hand build with. All right, and so when you wedge clay, the idea is that you're adding air to, and that gives the bacteria more uh, ability to grow. All right. So, and having a lot of bacteria allows you to get more plasticity without more shrinkage. Okay, so, and then the next thing that accounts for plasticity is carbonation matter. So in clay, it's a sedimentary material. So um, 
it, it comes with organic matter and then uh, that needs to burn out if, if you're firing so that you uh, don't get pinholes. So uh, if you have a lot of carbonaceous clay in your clay body, for instance, like a fire clay that's got a lot of carbon and sulfur in it, uh, you can actually get reduction when you're doing a, um, the, the bisque firing because it's so much of that needs to burn out. So that's why you need to have also air all around uh, your uh, pieces in a bisque kiln and you need to um, uh, go slowly during certain periods. And I'm going to have a video on that, the firing cycle for you here soon. All right. So a couple more agents that account for plasticity. This would be water. So you can have no plasticity without water. And the type of water makes a difference. I can't give you all the details of it, but if you have well water or soft water or hard water, these all make a difference in how your clay will perform. All right, and then aging is the last agent of, uh, that accounts for plasticity, and that means it just takes time for, uh, like say, all the water to get around particles, for bacteria to form, particles to align, etc. All right. So, for instance, like in the olden days, like say a potter would have some children and then they would have grandchildren. And then th that person might make clay for their grandchildren and bury it in the ground. And so that over the course of, say, 25 or so years, uh, all these things would occur. More bacteria, uh, you know, the particles would align the... Um, uh, water would get around all the clay particles, then that would be a very plastic clay that this uh, his grandson would use. So that's how we did it in the old days. Nowadays, we can basically use high-speed blenders and get clay very, um, uh, very plastic very quickly. Uh, before I'm done, I'm going to show you, I have a bunch of recipes here. And I'll sh one of the best things I ever did was to take a bunch of recipes and then I mixed them up, a thousand grams. That's about two pounds. And, a, and then I blended it with my blender and then I poured it on a plastic, plaster bat. And so immediately I could then use it within like a half an hour and then I could test what, uh, what different clays did. All right, well, let's take a little detour here since I forgot to show you this. These are the uh, books that I wanted to show you about. This Chappelle's book is a very good book. It's got clay recipes in there. This is, These are uh, some old, very old books. Uh, Daniel Rhodes. I get books from the library that are, um, whenever I see something, this I got from Dallas a long time ago. This is also a good book. It has a bunch of um, exercises for you so if you can get this book you know you can just go through all kinds of different exercises and then this is always a great book ceramic science for the potter this is robert to clay bodies uh etc so there's a, and this is always a fantastic book this is just a really good read um all right so where are we left now? We, <laughs> we did the first one, plasticity. Hey, we're making progress. All right. So now, uh, of the physical, prop, physical characteristics of clay, plasticity is one, and then shrinkage is another. So you're always going to have shrinkage because there's water between the clay particles. So in a clay body, you're going to have uh, between, say, 20 and 40% uh, of water. Uh, depends on how wet that you know wet it is. Uh, so when you when that water leaves, you're going to have a six percent wet to dry shrinkage average, and then you're going to also probably have a six to eight percent fired shrinkage. That's from fusion of the feldspar or the flux in the body. Okay, so now. Clay bodies are all going to be different, which we'll talk to you in a minute about that. But so say you have a sculpture body with a lot of grog and stuff. You may not have that high of a shrinkage, but uh, if you have a very th plastic throwing body, you may have a, maybe even a little more. 
All right, so there's types of water in clay. There's film water, which is the water that's going to go around these particles. That's called film water. There's pore water, which is what happens. These, these particles are aligned like cattywampus. They're not like all aligned perfectly. And so when, when the, this particle shrink and come together like this, that will up create a pore and so there's water in there that's just physical water that's still present even though it feels like it's dry there's still a little water in there and then the last type of water would be bound water or chemical water which is on this molecule that's the water and when you bisque fire you drive that water off and it becomes this is a clay particle and then when the water goes away, this is a ceramic or bisque ware. Okay? So what they're saying is like 40% of the, of, of the clay is water, 20 would be lubricant, 10 would be pour, and 10 would be chemical. I mean, that's just a general, it gives you a general idea. All right, so now let's do absorption. So this is after firing. Uh, so once I have fired uh, an earthenware clay, it's probably got a 8% absorption or more. Uh, and if I fire a stoneware, ideally it should have 1% to 2% absorption at cone 10, and maybe, I'm going to say 2 to 6 at cone 6. And porcelain always wants to have less than 1%, less than 1% absorption at both cone 6 and cone 10. So, and the way you do that is you run an absorption test. Now, I don't, I'm, I don't have it here. You can Google it. I'll probably show it to you after we do the, um, uh, when we do the wild clay video. All right, so now the basic idea here is you, if you're doing functional pottery, you want to use a clay body that's designed for the cone you fire to. So if you're doing cone six, you want a clay body that's cone six. You don't want to use a cone 10 body because you'll have too much absorption uh, when it's fired lower. So if, if this uh, stoneware was 2% at cone 10, at cone 6 it might be 6% absorption or lower. And so that may be too much, uh, the too much water would be absorbed when it's in the dishwasher or when you put it in the microwave it would get hot because that water had absorbed. Uh, so you're going to try to use a cone 6 body or a cone 10 body or a low fire body if you're doing low fire. All right. All right. Our next property is going to be hardness. Uh, so in the raw state, uh, we have a certain amount of hardness. Like say, for instance, I've thrown something and now it's... Um, it's we call it green uh and if i can crush it real easily that's a very low uh dry strength if it's very hard in that state it's a high dry strength and that comes from plasticity so if you have a clay body with a bunch of ball clay and because ball clay has shrinkage that will shrink down and create a strong um dry strength okay so if you had a body with a lot of grog in it and a lot of fillers, then when that dries, there's nothing, there's no, no strength to it. It can chip real easy. So that's a consideration for you to have when you're making a clay body. All right, now in the fired state, the hardness, so the flux at low fire is what glues or welds the particles together, called sintering or, uh, you know, just uh, fluxing them together. Uh, but at high fire, you get strength from molite forming. And usually uh, at high fire, you want to have some feldspar in the clay. And we'll talk about the structure of these uh, clay bodies a bit later. Now, all clay fired to the proper temperature will develop hardness by itself, um, but each has a different range. And so what, what you want to do when you're doing this, if you're testing this, you run a compression test. Uh, we can talk about that later too. You can Google it also. Uh, and so I already said this about don't use a cone 10 body at cone six. And like if you see a raccoon clay body, it'll say, 
cone 04 to cone 10. Uh, but that is only for sculpture. It's not, uh, so if you do sculpture, you don't really care too much about absorption because, you know, you're just, this is, if it's going to be inside, it doesn't really matter. But if you're doing functional work and you fired a cone 10 body to cone 04, it would uh, probably absorb 18% water. So that's very bad. Um, and then if you're doing outdoor work, you have to have other considerations because if it's in freeze-thaw uh, climate, you have to have it very vitrified. All right, so now we're going to talk about color. So the color of clay is, there's two, two, you know, two, two things to think about. The raw color, so that's before firing, and then the fired color. So the fired color can be affected by oxidation or reduction. Uh, and then um, uh, what you do is you combine natural clays. Like you'll in the clay body, you're going to put red art. So that's an earthenware clay to make it like iron to add iron to the body to give it color. Or you could add Barnard or Newman. That's a fire clay you can add or Lysella. Uh, so, ver so that's going to be uh, versus having kaolin, which is white, or ball clay, which is off-white. Uh, and you can also add stains um, and oxides to clay body, so you can make colored clays that way. All right, so now we're going to talk about texture. So fired clay is not just visual, but it's tactile. So you want to, many times when people are choosing a clay, they're going to not only look at what color it is, but they're going to see how it feels and how it, how plastic it is or how coarse it is. And so all that depends on the type of clay you put in there and the type of grog. And so you're going to mix up clays in it. So you would put in some fire clay and then that's not, uh, that's not uh, plastic enough. So you're going to add some ball clay, but if you want it wider, we're going to add some kaolin like that. If we want it darker, we're going to add some Lysella. So that's the basic idea. All right. So so that all depends on the type of clay you use, like fire clay, and there, there's types of fire clay. So if you've got hawthorn, you can also get types of hawthorn. There's 50 mesh and 35 mesh. Uh, and kaolin is like 200 mesh. Forgot to write that on there. Uh, ball clays are 200 mesh. Uh, red art is 200 mesh. All right. So then you're going to also add fillers to create texture. So some of those fillers might be sand or feldspar or granite uh, or grogs. And you can buy grogs in different grades too. Like there's one I know called 12 to 20. There's one to 20 to 48. That's telling you how coarse the particles are. The smaller the number, the coarser it is. So that's very coarse. That's medium coarse, et cetera. And then another way to affect texture is from burnishing, like putting terra sige on there, and then you, or even slips on top, you can just, it can smooth out the surface a little. While I got you here, the, this is, uh, this is a tea bowl with granite uh, and feldspar inclusions in it. And this one is definitely feldspar. You can see it's like oozing out of there. Uh, not very functional. All right, so we're coming to the end here. We're get, doing pretty well. I just want to give you sort of an overview now. So say you're going to construct a clay body. Clay bodies are uh, clay, the, the way we talk about them is clay flux and filler is what's in a clay body. Now this is, is as opposed to a glaze, which is flux, refractory, and glass former. But in clay body, you talk about clay, flux, and filler. So in the clay category, these were all in the other lecture about types of clay. Kaolin, ball clay, stoneware, fire clay, earthenware, and bentonite. You're going to combine those in certain proportions to make the clay body that you want. You know, if you want a porcelain, you'll start here. If you want an earthenware, you'll start there. And then what you're going to want in there, in the flux category, we're going to have to have a feldspar, which would be like Custer, Nefsi, Talc, Fritz. These are all, this is the thing you would like the most is feldspar, because what feldspar does in a clay body is it melts slowly over a range of temperature. And so that's what we like in ceramics, so we don't get warping and stuff. 
But sometimes, like at cone six, we're gonna need to add something to help it melt. Uh, and small amounts of these whiting or bone ash can make uh, uh, that, uh, what, whatever the type of that, I forgot the name, but, uh, anyway, I forgot the name of it. Uh, then this one here is a, this is filler, this category. So clay flux filler, and filler is silica or mullite. You can have grogs, pyrax, granite. You can have burnout bodies, coffee grounds, couscous, rice, etc. Those are all dif different ways to uh, use fillers in your clay body. All right, so now what I want to say is... Here is an example of, of, some, of a recipe for porcelain. So they would use 55 grolic, that's a kaolin, and then you would add 25 custard, that's our flux, and silica is our filler. All right, and the reason this is, doesn't add up to 100 and is left like this is in, in clay bodies, you don't want to be weighing these out on a gram scale. You want to use bags. So kaolin comes from England and it comes in a 55-pound bag because they, they use metric system there. And then you can get a 50-pound a bag of feldspar and a 50-pound bag of silica. So you'd use two bags, one bag, one bag. All right, so then to do a stoneware, this is cone 10, that was cone 10 porcelain. This is cone 10 stoneware. So what, what, you're, what you want to do is look at w what the constituents are. That is the, this is all clay. This is the flux and this is the filler. Now, some of these things can act as filler also, but this is just generally the idea. So of our clays, here is a this is a this is a fire clay hawthorn. This is a type of fire clay, kind of an in between. Plus, it's very fine. That's two hundred mesh. This is thirty five mesh. And so then we're also adding a ball clay for plasticity. So then you can see the percentages. This is an almost ninety percent of of our stoneware body is are these ingredients. Then we have some flux and some filler. All right, now say for instance, I was doing a cone 10. Uh, I'm sorry, a cone six body. I'm gonna, uh, say I'm gonna start with some, uh, they see 20, 20, 20, 10. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a, some grolic and I'm gonna add some ball clay. This is a stoneware clay, Foundry Hill Cream. And here's a fire clay. So they use one of each type and then uh, the the nephsi is the flux, and then talc is to help it flux even more. So what I try to do is I try to look at a bunch of clay bodies, break them down, clay, flux, and filler. There's not really filler, but the hawthorn is acting as a filler because it's a fire clay. All right, and then the last one, just to give you some structure, is a low fire body. This is a red low fire body. So first thing we do, we're gonna look at our clay. So we got ball clay, fire clay, earthenware clay, earthenware clay. So this will be a dark red body, and the talcs to help it to melt, and the fritz. Whereas in a high fire body, we use custer, but in a low fire body, we need some frit. Okay, I think my time might be about up, but I want to show you that you should probably, I got all these recipes. You can find so many recipes now. These I, all, I got from alfredgrindingroom.com, and that's their Instagram feed. And uh, you can just pull these up and uh, print, print them out. So it gives you all kinds of earthenware bodies. And it's a fabulous site because what they've got on there, they have these in the dry, so they're showing you the range of firing. This is a cone 10 body, and they're showing you dry, uh, low, fire, low fire, mid range, high fire, what they look like at each temperature. And then they tell you the shrinkage, and they tell you the absorption. So this is like an outstanding uh, site and an outstanding way to learn about constructing clay bodies. Okay, it's all up there. You can grab that. Bunch of bodies. 
bunch of their actual clays that they're using uh, for the sophomore class or for the throwing class, etc. All right, and then what I'm going to do next time, I'm going to show you this where I put these recipes in this type of a sheet, and then I can categorize them, kaolin, ball clay, earthenware, etc., fluxes, and I can start to see uh, structures of clay bodies. All right, kids, I think that's all I got for you today. Go make 100 clay bodies and call me in the morning.